Good afternoon, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here and thanks for taking the time to come here this afternoon. Um, I've deliberately titled the, uh, this talk uh, The Journey of Innovation because it is a journey. And for me, the journey started uh, about 35 years ago with a life-changing experience for myself. And I'll talk about that a little bit later on. But 25 years ago, I read 14 words, which again, changed the way that I thought about things in the, my life and what I intended to do with uh, my career and so forth. And those words were, if you do what you've always done, you're going to get what you've always got. And that was 25 years ago, and that set me on a certain path of career that, that took me on a long and winding road. And only four days ago, I was in Melbourne, and I, I read another little, little uh, few words which I thought were in line with what I'd read 25 years ago and very consistent with the message I want to give you today. And that, that message was insanity. Insanity is all about doing the same thing every day in the same way and expecting a different outcome. So let's not leave things and do things in an insane way and let's, let's start innovating. So let me take you through our story at Immune Systems Therapeutics. And what we are is, we're a drug development company now. We started as a research company, um, a, a drug antibody engineering company, and we've become a research company, a research drug, uh, drug development company. And that little picture there is, a, is a, just a, a picture of our uh, molecule, it's a protein. I'm not gonna describe it because there's probably somebody in the audience gonna ask a difficult question on that, and I, I'm not gonna go there. But what our, our antibody is, it's a very special antibody. Um, the, the first target that we're using this antibody on is a, a disease called multiple myeloma, which in simple terms is a, uh, a cancer in the, that, uh, a blood cancer. And the special thing about our antibody is it really is very, very specific. It attacks the bad cells and leaves the good cells alone. And anyone that has any experience with cancer would, would know that that's a very good thing. So what does, just quickly to, why are we bothering at all? Why are, we converse, why are we focused on multiple myeloma? It's a damn horrible disease. People who get it are typically older people. And like Stefan said, the older people have got a, a few problems ahead. Superannuation is one of them. This is another one. And how it presents in, in uh, patients is that it shows up as lesions. Uh, the, the disease gets into the, in, you know, inside the bone marrow and presents itself as lesions in the bone. What that is a polite way of saying is the, the cancer will actually eat away at, the, at your skeleton and creates lots of pain in the bone and causes significant problems with your immune system and effectively you die. Um, that, that's what the disease is all about. So what I want to do deal with now is why are we commercialising um, our, our antibody for this target? And the, the really commercial answer to that is there's an unmet um, need, but that's only part of the story. And what is the unmet need? Well, there's a, currently there's a $4 billion market uh, today uh, for other forms of treatment. So that, that got our attention a little while back. Um, the current two drugs that are being used to treat this disease are Revlimid and Velcade. And, you know, they do a job, but they prolong life. They don't, they don't, there's no curative effect with either of those two um, current forms of treatment. And it actually makes the people who are taking it very, very sick. And that's what we, uh, we don't like. So if that's part of the story, what I want to do now is talk about commercialisation. What you'll see in the top line there is just one of the pathways that a lot of people talk about with commercialisation, and it's the research pathway. And it's very linear, and it talks about research and preclinical R&D and phase one trials and phase two trials and full development, and it just so, seems like it's all so simple. But the little pathway that, or the area we're working at the moment is this area here with the yellow line, and typically there's a funding gap of about let's call it 70, 100 million dollars to do those phases of work. And that's, that's a real challenge for, uh, for researchers. Um, this picture here is, is one way of looking at words that you're gonna hear a lot probably over the, today, and if you deal with the department, 
you've heard about the Valley of Death. I like this very visual picture because what it does, it says there's some really lonely little researchers down here and they're in this massive sort of platter here and they've got mountains on either side and on one side there's research and on the other side there's clini uh, clinical development. You know, big gap there. So how do we get there? Um, the second sort of little, whoops, the second thing I want to sort of bring out that I don't see being talked about very much is this area of this line here. Everything else stays the same except we add to the researchers who are very lonely, we add some commercial innovators. They're the entrepreneurs, they're the people who are gonna come in and help get this drug into the marketplace. So the landscape didn't change a lot other than we've added some people. And the challenges are still there to find that 70 to 100 million dollars. And you know what, it's not linear. The commercial pathway is full of you know, winding paths, it's gray, it's difficult, um, but it's a challenge. So how does, what does our challenge look like over the last sort of 10 years? Um, I'm trying to, what I'm trying to get across here is a story that's been going on for 20 years and 20 minutes. And I'm not gonna try and deal with everything on that graph, but to say, whoops, I'll have to stop flicking my finger. What I wanted to say is the, you need to continually build with innovation and build towards a certain goal of commercialization. And what this is saying is we've built a pathway of success over the last 10 years. And one of the things that we, um, that has helped us quite frankly, is uh, I don't want this to be a commercial, but getting funding from the government at various critical times has been really important for us. And it's, it's kept us focused. And we've received grants from both state government and federal government. And throughout the journey, we've been uh, receiving R&D tax uh, rebates and grants. And, a number of people, mainly from the department, have talked about they think that's a good idea and so do I. I see lots of criticism in Australian press over the current R&D uh, tax program and, you know, there's no one story which is 100% wrong or 100% right. But for us, it's been a terrific uh, bonus. Uh, in commercial terms, it's non-dilutionary money, so it's not hurting founders or investors. Um, and we actually enjoy the rigour that it's been put upon. Um, I had an experience of working with a number of people from uh, the biotechnology industry in Canberra recently, uh, earlier this year, and I found Duron, the chief executive of the, um, of the Commercialisation Australia, having to defend a position of not, you know, not providing enough health, help to the, the sector. And, now, it really disappointed me that biotech companies are sitting there and complaining about the help they're getting. Uh, and the quality of the help. I, I think universally, um, biotechnology in Australia is not um, you know, homo homogenous, nor is probably the help from the department. But you, you've actually got to get off your bum and learn how to work with the department and, and learn how to actually take advantage of what they're offering is my advice to people in this room and anyone that I talk to. So, um, Having a strategic plan is really important and having a business model that you are building your strategic plan around is important. And our business plan is built around the fact in biotechnology that it's all about intellectual property. And the, the thing that you need to do with intellectual property is continually discover, validate, protect, commercialise and grow your intellectual property portfolio. And you can have any sort of strategic plan you like and you'll need to break up the role or the things that you're going to do because there are limited resources, both people and capital. And it almost doesn't matter what I've got on this slide with regard to the sorts of things that we had in the, the first stage of our plan over, the, over the, like two years, four years and six years. But it's really important that you go through the process when you're a young company uh, to actually do, develop a plan because it gets you focused um, and quite frankly, the people that are really going to be interested in in uh, have you having a strategic plan is the investor. The investor wants to know, do you know what you're talking about? Do you know where you're going? Do you know how you're going to get there? And what you need to convince an investor is a bit of a roadmap. They'll buy into you if you've got a roadmap. They, they don't expect it to be a railway line, but you need to have that roadmap. So 
our roadmap in terms of investment, timing and value, it all looks very, when you're doing on graphs, it all looks very, as I said, you know, nice curves, um, linear movement, etc. It's not like that. Things happen very rapidly at times in the, in the strategic plan and you have to be prepared to, take, to innovate and take advantage of it. For us, what's happening at the moment is a couple of exciting things. We've got our chief executive, and if anyone was here for Stefan's talk, uh, Stefan talked about old people and the master's games and how it's good for old people to keep busy. Well, our new chief executive is about 46. He holds the world record for 1,500 metres and 800 metres, and he's very active. But I don't think he'd ever want to be termed old. So any of you who are into the master's games there, keep at it. Um, you're not old. So what we're focused on at the moment is our licensing, and that's a really important milestone for a company like ours. Because what it does, it validates um, the fact that you're on the right track, you'll find a partner for the rest of the journey, and hopefully it keeps you in, uh, gives you the opportunity to grow your business and create something quite special here in Australia in biotechnology. That's the way we're looking at our plan. The next big step for us is to launch our, our product after we do a phase, what's called a phase two pivotal trial. And launching our product means we're gonna have our drug in commercial quantities going into people in, in clinics. And that'll happen all, all over the world. But we've got to actually get through that next phase of regulatory approval, and that's not an easy task. Is it worth it, all this? You know, the price that we're looking at and the way we're scoping our, our efforts at the moment is we're looking at a price that you know, we think's worth somewhere between 150 and $500 million. And, you know, do you want me to, I could say it's 150, I could say it's 500. It's actually not that much different. Uh, it could easily be $500 million with our drug and it depends how we're positioning ourselves and in our, our negotiations with pharma companies, it's gonna be at least $150 million, but 500 depends how good we are. Um, but it's also binary. Along the way, there's no guarantees with drug development. We're very happy with the results that we've got and we're very hopeful that the partner will, will enjoy the, the data that we're providing to them. Um, so that's the sort of prize and why we're continuing our efforts to go after it. So, capital needs. I don't want anyone to walk out of this room and think this is easy. And using the term that I have already used, the valley of death, if you look down here, we've had the valley of death. We've faced the valley of death every single year of our existence since 2000 when we incorporated. You raise money, you spend it. You raise money, you spend it. You raise money, you spend it. It's a cycle of get, getting excited about having a success, doing the job that you have to do, running out of money. And for these days, one of the things that the government should be looking at is really um, how do we, we take away for a sector like bio, biotechnology that really relies on you know, the smart end of town? How do you take away for directors the pain of, of um, you know, running out of money and protecting your reputation, staying in business, because accounting rules, ASIC and ASX and all of those, the, the, they don't really um, cater for the biotech sector who is doing this sort of thing constantly. So what we have done is we've raised money from shareholders. Uh, currently it's about $13 million. We're in the market at the moment raising another 10, so that's where we're up to with that. We've received about $6 million in total from the government. We had a biotechnology agreement which generated about $11 million of value for us. And we're now looking at a pharma licence and I also mentioned new money. What, what's the new money? These are these big blocks here. And they relate to getting a licence milestone and let's call that $30 million. And the reason it's a block is we'll use that $30 million that we get from our, our pharma licence as an upfront payment to do our phase two trial and then it's gone. So you need more money from the partner to de develop up other things, and I'll explain what they are in a moment. But really, the capital needs of the company are not this dribbling that often occurs in the biotechnology sector for, um, for new companies. And there are a number of solutions, and venture capital is one of them, and it, that takes you down a certain path. 
Um, it's not universally, uh, I, I think, acknowledged, particularly in Australia, that venture capital is the answer. The funds are quite small, but they do fill a, a, need in the, a niche in the marketplace uh, that can help companies. We have chosen not to take any venture capital at the moment, but for these big chunky bits over here, I think we'll be talking to a number of venture capitalists, both here and overseas. Okay, well, I said we needed money to do certain things. Well, this is our pipeline of uh, additional uh, products that we've got working, uh, that we're working on at the moment. And to give that some scope, because it's just a couple of lines on a graph, our IP and those that work there represents a marketplace that's currently being uh, filled in oncology and autoimmune diseases of about $40 million, $38, $40 million, depending on how you want to count it. So again, the prizes are very big. It costs a lot of money to go after it, and the secret is to have a product that actually works. So if you've got all that sort of working for you, then you actually start building out a pipeline and go after the, the prizes that, you, that are there for you. And don't, don't think we're so naive that we think we're going to capture that entire $40 billion. We don't have to. Uh, capturing a small part of that would be a very good thing for Australia and our, our company. So going back quickly to a reminder of why are we commercialising? Um, I want to make it real for you. There is an unmet need, and I've talked about market dynamics and the size of the market and our competitors and all that sort of thing, and you do have to understand that uh, if you're going to go into a business like biotechnology. But if you look at this woman here, she's on our clinical trial, uh, was on our clinical trial early this year, and the clinician... Uh, basically has given her uh, the, a classification which says she's had a remission. Remissions in multiple myeloma don't happen. So it sort of says our drug's working and we're building the data set at the moment to take this uh, much further. But we have one very happy camper and a dog that are really happy that they went onto the trial that we have. So first of all, there's the unmet need. Secondly, there's, what we're about is improving quality of life and importantly, when we started this whole journey of innovation and journey to set up our company, we were very clear about why we were doing it. Um, anyone that really has been to a business school will know that you have to actually focus. And what focus you, focus you, focuses a company in an aspirational way is a vision. And our vision is all about curing and improving survival for pe and eliminating suffering as well for people with blood cancers and uh, autoimmune diseases. So that's what we're about, heart, soul, mind, and, and in a value sense. So moving towards the end, what I want to do is just sort of say, what have we learned al along this journey? We've learned a lot of things. And it's, we've learned a lot of, a lot of people have learned a lot of different things on the journey that we've been on as a company. And I've listed a number of them. The doing what matters. Um, that's pretty much where I started. When I mentioned to you I started my journey 35 years ago, what that, that sort of instant in my life was is I was diagnosed with cancer and given six to 12 months to live. And that was on my wed first wedding anniversary. And I spent the next seven months in hospital going through a horrible, I was a guinea pig basically, and they cut bits out and they put as many drugs as they could get into me and they irradiated me and it was horrible. And the one conclusion I drew at the end of that process was, uh, I've got to do something about the way research is done. It's crappy. It really is a lousy way to treat human beings. And, you know, having all your bits cut out and things put into you, it's not the way to do medical research. And I, I said to my wife at the time, one day we're going to do something about that. And that's why I became a little bit interested in this whole area. So that's, that's what doing matter, and that's what being passionate is all about. You will not succeed in this biotechnology sector if you're not passionate. Um, I'm going to duck that back for a minute. I just want to talk about capital adequacy in terms of, I've rated that number two be, behind doing what matters. It matters enormously to have the right amount of money. You can starve good researchers by not having the money to allow them to do the things that you want to do. There is many, many arguments you'll find in the biotech sector about that, particularly are put forward by founders and investors. And it's that never-ending story of let's get a return before we dilute people. You know, the, the bottom line is you need, if you want success, you're going to have to do the things that are needed and do the things that are matter 
and therefore get the capital that's required. No point having uh, just doing anything. In biotechnology, it's really hard to pick um, winners. And many, many of Australian biotech companies are, are actually doing things which will be important, but they're going to have minor changes to the current treatment regimes or standards of care. What matters is to find a drug if you're lucky enough to do it, and this is luck. Us finding this drug is luck. Um, is finding a drug that will actually make a difference to the standard of care for the diseases that you're applying it to. And that's what's really important to us, is take a leadership role, not just in Australia, but globally in this area. And that's what we're attempting to do now that we're actually getting ourselves out through trials uh, to the world and to the clinicians that are called key opinion leaders. We're now talking to them and they're getting a bit excited about what we've got. Um, really important, it doesn't matter what business is you're in, but you know, really employ the right team and focus on the right team at, at the right time. It does change. Um, I mentioned earlier we've just replaced our chief executive and we found a person with the right skills, financial skills, clinical skills to actually uh, head the company up. And sometimes these are difficult things when you're on boards to, to manage, but succession planning and doing those sorts of things is critical. And the worst thing you can do is leave the wrong, the wrong people there at the wrong time. Um, build relationships. Relationships need to be built with government, with the people that fund you, the investors, with clinicians, with researchers, and the relationships need to be built with the best people there are in the field, and they need to be built globally. Don't just think of Australia. That diseases don't have boundaries. So think of your relationships in terms of building them globally. Um, and keep an eye out on the market constantly. The market changes. The minute you lodge, a, um, a, lodge an approval with the FDA or in Europe for uh, an approval to have your drug uh, regulated, then the world knows about it. And the world will focus on you and come after you and they'll ask you questions and it creates a lot of interest. But the world will focus on you, so keep an eye on those markets and what's happening. And I think I've said it enough already, but innovate constantly and with purpose. Be very clear about the innovations you're doing both on a research front and on a commercial front and do it constantly. Remember, don't if you want the same results, just keep doing the same things. So that brings me to the last point I wanted to make is, this is really hard stuff here. And it's harder in some ways because you're in Australia. But tyranny of distance is no excuse for, not, for, for saying, no, I won't pursue something that matters. So don't give up. Keep at it if you've got something you believe in and are passionate about, and really go after and look for those people that can help you, is where I want to finish the, the, the talk today. So thank you very much for all of you, and I'm happy to take questions.